name is Kevin Gorham. I'm an Android developer. I work at the Electric Coin Company doing Zcash, which is like a Bitcoin crypto thing. And today I'm going to talk about coroutines. Um, but before I start, I just want to poll and ask how many people in the audience have written code that's in production right now with a show of hands that uses coroutines in production. OK. That's more than I expected. That's a, that's a good number. How about how many people here have written a line of coroutine code at all? OK, that's about half the room. How about anyone heard of coroutines? All right, that's a trick question, because I just said that word like 10 times. So um, the talk that I'm doing is motivated by, or, or it's summed up really well by this statement here. Um, and I would paraphrase that. So Roman works at JetBrains, and he's prolific. I have a lot of respect for him. I could talk my whole talk about how amazing he is. But in this statement, it really captures the whole motivation for me standing here right now and wanting to do this. And if I paraphrase it, he's basically saying the, the documentation is OK, but in order to use coroutines effectively, you have to understand all of it a lot. So not just understand it, but understand it a lot. And this might imply that coroutines are hard. But th there's a lot of things that work that way. It doesn't mean that coroutines themselves are hard. It just means that they are layered. So you can think of it maybe like geometry. Geometry itself is not really that hard. It's just made up of a bunch of things that you have to understand all of them in order to use geometry effectively. So you need to know subtraction. You need to know addition. Just there's some key things that if you know them, then it helps. It can, it can be boiled down to those key concepts. And so you might think that you could take maybe a six-year-old or a, a young child. I have a lot of kids. I think in those terms. And maybe my nine-year-old, she doesn't know geometry. But if I just help her with, I, I give her a protractor, I give her a compass, I give her some basic ideas, she can do geometry just a little bit more effectively. So what are the key things for developers to use coroutines more effectively? A lot of us here are using them. So how do we? do what Roman was saying, like understand all of it um, so that we can uh, do it well. And that's what we're going to explore here. So to do this, I'm going to use a puzzler. Uh, if you are like me, I've been in talks where people take polls. And if they're like the one I did at the start, it's fine. It's, it's, it's innocent. But sometimes when you're doing a puzzler, you kind of don't want to participate because you don't want to put your hand up and be that guy who's completely wrong and all the smart people are disagreeing, or, or the reverse, you don't want to look like a jerk and think you know everything. So we created this, co this um, talk coroutines channel in the app. And I'm going to open that up here just so I can see it. But you can go into this channel and find a poll at the top. And so I'm going to walk through this puzzler, talk about it a bit. And we're going to be asking, what does this print? And so in the channel, you can vote anonymously and just say what you think and what you think the answer is. No one will know who said it, and you can vote one time. So let's begin. So I'm, I'm trying to create a realistic-ish scenario. So let's say you have a process, and you need to run two things, and you want to do something that's going to take a long time. Maybe you think of a virus scanner or something that's just going to scan a bunch of files. And you don't want to leave the user sitting there on a frozen screen waiting if their scan is done. And so you launch another process to monitor the progress on the scan. And so one routine is going to launch off and monitor progress. You want to get that set up and ready before you actually start making progress. And then the, the scan is going to go. And hopefully, when, when all of that is complete, um, I'll, I'll come back to that. But for the monitoring progress, we, for the purpose of this puzzle, we could just say that it's going to print starting at the beginning and report progress. Beyond that, it doesn't really matter. And for scanning files, we'll just say that it's going to print scanning at the beginning, and that's it. And then when all is said and done, we're going to print done. So the question is, what does this print? Does it print starting, then scanning, and then done? I see we have some votes. Does it just print done? I don't want to give any clues. Um, or are you not sure? There's people, maybe you just heard of coroutines routines for the first time today. And, and that's OK. So if you're in the channel, you can see what people are voting. For those who can't see that, um, there's an overwhelming number of people that are voting correctly right now. Well, this is a puzzler. The, trick an the, the answer is, I'm not sure. It's actually kind of a trick question. Because it doesn't do either. 
What prints here is it prints done immediately, and then it prints starting, and it never prints scanning. Why? Well, I could just point out all the things and tell you why I didn't do that, but then my talk would be over and it wouldn't be a point. So like Roman said in the beginning, you kind of have to understand a lot of things, and then you can use those concepts to do coroutines a bit more effectively. So what we're going to do is just go through some of those concepts, and we'll circle back to this puzzle and apply those concepts as we go, and hopefully it'll start making more sense. One of the things about uh, coroutines is there's a lot of documentation out there. There's tons of, of, of medium posts, there's tons of videos, and the content is there, but all of the content doesn't address that problem where you kind of have to know a broad swath. And so I'm going to try and cover a broad swath and, and go through a bunch of things, and to do that, I'm going to kind of give a Cliff Notes version of some of the sections, just pulling out some key ideas that we can speak to. We're all using this a bit, so hopefully it, it works out okay. So let's walk through the key concepts of coroutines. Coroutines are alternative to blocking threads. They're nicer, they're shorter, they're easier to read. They, there's no two actions in the same coroutine can be concurrent. This one's important, it has <coughs> little, little green stars by it. Um, so I think the most important part of coroutines are suspending functions. You can kind of think if you're forming a mental model around suspending functions and what they are, suspending functions are like a scaffolding or a, or a skeleton. It's tooling that enables it all. One way that I just think of it is not this, but I think of it maybe like an annotation. So an annotation is a tool for the compiler that helps the compiler do things. The suspend function creates a, it, it's a keyword that you use, and it creates that opportunity for the compiler to jump in and do a bunch of things and basically create coroutines. The thing is that suspend is not synchronized. We're all Java developers and we're familiar with synchronize, and you can add synchronize to methods and, and you get some non-blocking properties. Um, suspend functions don't work that way. The suspend modifier does not make code non-blocking, or in other words, suspend isn't magic. So if it's not magic, then what are suspend functions? What are suspending functions doing? So the Cliff Notes version, I would say, they, free, they don't freeze the UI, which is really important. Um, it does not block the calling thread. When it returns, all the work is done. This, is, this one's really important. Um, it's basically a compiler tool, and it should not launch coroutines. Another important thing to keep in mind. So if you're going to be launching coroutines, you kind of need a place to do that. And the old way, there was, it kind of felt shoehorned in. So you may say, okay, I'm gonna launch this process that's going to monitor for progress, and I'm gonna let the user know when I'm 100% done my scanning, but I kind of need to do that on the UI thread. So the developers need some control over where this, this concurrent events are happening. And before, because Coroutines has been you know, methodically developed and experimental, and uh, about you know, uh, several months ago, you would do it like this. You would, you would kind of just tell it, when you do this thing, just do it on the UI thread. Well, that, um, it, it felt like they're just like, hey, here you go, here's a scope. Uh, is, is, does that work out? <laughs> and the answer is no, not really. They, they iterated and made scopes a fundamental thing. So this is a, a big part of coroutines, where scopes are a first order citizen. They can manage all of the concurrent, all the coroutines that happen within their, their lifespan, um, they can help with a lot of things that we'll cover, but the, the most important point is that, I'm trying to think of how to summarize, it's, it's I don't want to put opinion in and say it's brilliant, but if, if you think about Kotlin, and this is just kind of like to a, aside, like what is Kotlin? Kotlin is a programming language. Okay, no, not really. Kotlin is a community. Think of what's happened with Kotlin where all of these developers from all over the world have got the best and brightest ideas and created something that we all love to use. I love using Kotlin. When I was using Java and it was getting, you know, not keeping up with, with other technologies, switching to Kotlin was a breath of fresh air. Well, that process came out of the community. They have a way of taking really brilliant minds and putting them together and moving the state of the art forward. And so, a scope is, is really kind of born out of that, and, and a scope is <coughs> about 
life. And during this talk, I like, was getting to a point where I'm literally looking up the meaning of life. And <laughs> it's the period between birth and death. Everything has a life. Because your application is going to die, everything within the application eventually inherits that life. Everything eventually has a scope. So when you're working with coroutines, you just think about like, what is the lifespan of the, the work that I need to do. With the, when I'm monitoring progress, when does that monitoring need to stop? If I'm scanning files, when does the scan need to stop? Maybe for a scan, it stops when it's done. That would be nice. Maybe, maybe it can't stop when it's done. Maybe someone wants to check their Twitter and you want to stop when they leave. Maybe you want to keep going in the background. Like you have to kind of think about when is it over. And scopes help with that. And the way that they help with that is a scope you can really think of as a job plus a dispatcher. And if you break that down a little bit, a job helps with cleanup. I think of that as like cleanup is a dirty job. Jobs help you do that. Jobs can be canceled. That's how they're cleaned up. Jobs have parents. When a parent's canceled, it's, it's children's canceled. There's some complexity there. But the point is that the job is what enables that cleanup piece. Um, dispatchers help with concurrency. A scope is the thing that enables concurrency. Without a scope, there's, there's nothing uh, going on. So the question I would say, OK, so if the suspending function is not magic and it doesn't make things non-blocking, then how do you go from blocking to non-blocking? How do you, what's, what's going to make that work? Well, the answer is coroutine builders, like a sync and launch, those are builders. Launch is fire and forget, you, you start it, and then the next line of code runs. A sync, you're able to get a deferred and you can await for the results. Um, there's lots of documentation about how those pieces work, and those concepts are important, but they're, they're pretty easy to understand. There's a lot of pieces of coroutines that are just, they just make sense. And so a, the thing about coroutine builders is that they inherit their scope. So a builder, you use the builder rather than just doing it in another way because you want to create this ability for scopes to do what they want to do, to clean up and to, to manage concurrency. And so they're going to inherit their scope. The builder inherits, inherits its scope from um, the scope that you launch or, or call a sync on. And then there's also scoping functions. So if you're going to inherit a scope, you have to get a scope. So this is where things like with context and coroutine scope and supervisor scope, um, these are scoping functions that allow you to give a scope to these um, coroutine builders that they can inherit and everything can kind of work together. So what does that look like? It kind of looks like this. So your suspend function is going to have a, um, a scoping function. In this case, we're saying it's with context because we're going to fetch a user. And at the moment when I fetch a user, I'm going to actually do some I.O. This is like where the, the I.O. is happening. And so I know that every time I fetch the user, it's going to be I.O. And I confine that to um, a, a pool of threads that allow you to do that and not block the screen. And then once I have that scope, now I can launch within that scope. Every time I call launch or any other suspended function within this scope, it's going to kind of be captured under the umbrella of that parent. So the question is, do you always need with context? Because you need scope, right? Well, yes and no. Mostly no. Um, you, the time that you use or, or you want to use with context in these other scoping functions is as close to the I.O. operation as possible. So you might have, you might want to signal some process called start and you say, hey, developer, this is like a suspend function. Anything that calls this will suspend. So you signal that with the modifier. And, but when you run the method it's, or the function, it's really just going to delegate that and say, presenter, you go get me my user. And so in the presenter class, the presenter is going to say, well, I'm not getting users. Repository, you give me my user. And the repository is like, well, I'm not just going to go get a user all willy-nilly. Maybe I want to get it out of memory, and I don't need I.O. at all. And so that user cache can kind of encapsulate that. And maybe I need to get it off of disk. And now when I get it off of disk, this is the moment where the actual I.O. happens. So let's take a step back towards the cleanup piece of this. So scopes enable cleanup and Concurrency. Cleanup is a dirty job. What is cleanup? So there's two key words that sound really fancy. They make you feel good when you say them. There's structured concurrency, cooperative cancellation, 
all of these things are really not as hard as they sound. So they really have to do with cleanup. Um, in particular, just like not wasting resources, right? Because if you're doing something in the background and maybe you're accessing a file or maybe you're doing a network call, you want to make sure that you're not leaking those things. You want to make sure that you're not spinning up a bunch of them and, and losing track of them. And so structured concurrency is really just garbage. It's just like you can almost think of it like a garbage collector. It's just handling all of the subscribing and all of the annoying things that we kind of forget about every so often and you get those bugs. Concurrency bugs are painful. And so when you are creating all of these things and losing track of them, it, it, it can get to be incredibly complicated quickly. And so structured concurrency helps you to avoid that complexity. And cooperative cancellation is also a simple thing. It's like minding your ABCs. Always be canceling. So in the same way as you're writing code, you want to always be having a mind towards testing. You write your code with testing in mind. Well, you write coroutines with cancellation in mind. It's just something that's a part of the, the process. So everything can be cleaned up nicely. I would summarize that by saying adhere to structure concur concurrency and verify. That's the key piece. That's the piece that like, starts unlocking things. Because you want to verify using cancellation. You want to make sure that when you think things are going to cancel, when you think things are going to die, and their life is over, that that actually happens. So if a view or an activity is going away, everything in launch should be done. And if it's maybe a repository is doing some things with its own scope that it has, you would want that when that repository maybe call stop. If you were scanning files, for instance, it might have a stop method. You would want that to make sure that it cancels. But then you want to also make sure that if the activity cancels, it responds. And so that's where the structuring of jobs, where your activity, or really scopes, but the, your activity has a life cycle, your repository has a life, and they're connected, and they're related, and they clean up, and it's easy, and we can write nicer code that's easier to understand and reason about. Another important point is avoid writing functions that start coroutines without returning any handle to them. That's a, a, a lot of words on the slide. But it's all about the same thing. If you're going in your, if you remember from the cliff notes of structured, um, of suspend functions, they shouldn't be launching things. And so the, the reason, the real reason for that is because you don't want to lose track of things that are happening within that suspend function. And when the suspend function ends, everything should be done. So let's go back to our puzzle. Just to recap, uh, we've covered a lot of key topics, and we can begin to apply those concepts to the puzzle itself. So the first thing that we notice is that this is a suspend function, and it really shouldn't be launching things. It's launching something. Also, it's with context IO. Are we really sure that when we monitor progress, we want to do that and on the IO thread? Maybe we do. Maybe we don't. Um, so one way that we might approach that is say, maybe we can pass in a scope, and now I don't have the with context anymore. And if I want to monitor progress and you know, kick off some other background process, then I can do that in, in another thread pool. If I want to monitor progress on the UI, then I can pass in a scope that's on the main function. And when you look at that, that seems to make sense. But when you look closely, one of the recommendations is don't do that. Take the scope and slide it back. Make the scope a receiver. So this is a convention that's inside the Kotlin framework. All of the um, builder functions, you'll see this a lot in, in the coroutine code, this convention that if you're going to be launching something, do that as an extension function on coroutine scope. And once you've done that, you don't really need this scope anymore. So you get rid of that. And that starts to look a little bit better. And at this point, you're launching so you're not really a suspend function anymore. So now, this is really clean. And this is what coroutines do. They allow you to be asynchronous in a way that's easy to reason about. So you don't do things like this. Instead of that, you do this. You just follow these basic key approaches. So another reason that we might say that we don't want to pass in a scope like this is once you pass in the scope, you have to call launch. And you can't call launch unless you're inside of a scope. So what that means is you're probably going to be in a suspending function. Well, once you're in a suspending function and you have a scope, 
that gets really tempting to start using that scope to do things that aren't actually going to be done by the time the suspending function returns. It goes off on this scope, it launches some background work, maybe it's, it's, it's scanning files, for instance, and now your, your routine done because your routine is done or your function is done because remember launch is fire and forget. So you launch, you're scanning these files. Now your monitor progress method comes back, or in this case it'll be a scan files method that, that returns, and that process is still running in the background. Now, technically that's not bad. I, I did a lot of this early on when I was like trying to work through these things. It, because the scope still has, uh, it knows about this launch, it can still clean it up but it's just not the recommended way to do things. So if you can avoid passing scopes, do that. Um, and we can take these concepts and begin to go a little bit further. So we covered some key things. Maybe we can take the next step. So if you look at these two, what are they really saying? So they're saying, I want to monitor progress and I want to scan files. What that really means is you have two separate processes that want to communicate. Well, when you have coroutines that want to communicate, one coroutine might be running in a background thread, one coroutine might be running in the main thread, they're in separate contexts. And so that is dangerous. You know, you're, you're, you get into a situation where you have like shared mutable scope between threads, which is scary. So channels come to the rescue. Now with channels, you are able, the channels are communication primitive they avoid sharing mutable state. So let's look at this example, the puzzler, and let's add some channels in. And so we'll just create a couple of channels. We'll call one outbox for things that are going out. We'll call one inbox for the other way. And just one side note, this conflated broadcast channel, I put an emoji there. I really like this thing. Like <laughs> it's, it, its name is cumbersome, but it's very powerful. It's actually like a data flow value. It is, a channel that holds its last value. And the nice thing about it is you can get that last value out without opening a subscription. And so a lot of times when you're holding one value, you want to get the value, the current value. That's the, that's the whole point of the channel is to keep the current value. Well, with this conflated broadcast channel, you can just get that at any time. And it's really, really a convenient tool. I'm at, there's, a, there's an open issue to rename this, and I hope that that happens. Um, it's, it's like maybe like live data, but it's a really useful way to communicate information in a safe, way where you don't have to worry about sharing state and, and all these race conditions because it's all inside of a channel. So let's add channels to our puzzle. So here we scan files. So let's just pretend there's some delay and then we send progress. We send 50 and then we do some more things, some scanning, and we send another 100. And then you can also monitor progress with some channels. And so in here, channels are iterable, all this stuff you, know, you, you may have seen before. And so you can iterate and for every one of those progress values that come in, you can report progress. And then finally, when progress is 100, you can break. And so now, this same puzzle that we had before, it does what we want it to do. It prints starting. It prints scanning. Why? Because it launches those things. It launches them separately. But it doesn't actually do what we want with done. Because in this method, or this function before, we launched as that first line, and then done is going to happen right away. So how do we, how do, we do better? Well, we could join, kind of, and add, add a join in. That won't really help because the monitor progress is launching. Um, and it's not going to help. So, and, and it's also silly. Like, if you look at that, you're, you're launching something, you're joining something, you can just get rid of those things and flatten it out and maybe just monitor progress and scan files. And already the code is coming a bit more uh, readable. But the problem is, the still is going to call done immediately because we launch. Each of these functions, monitor progress, fire and forget. It's going to go monitor progress and be done, and then go scan files and be done, and then we're going to print done. It's like, no, we're not done. We need to actually finish. So launching is not what we want here. We don't want these two methods to launch. What we actually want is for them to wait. And that's where things like a sync can help. And so maybe we just make these a sync. Now, just that easily, these functions are going to give you a mechanism that you can use to wait. So you wait for both of those to finish. You can use a wait all. And now, you look at this, and this makes sense. And it does what we want. 
this code will print starting, scanning, done. And better yet, it doesn't print done until progress reaches 100%. Because we're, a, we're waiting for that scan to complete. And the scan doesn't complete until, well, well, the scan gets to 100, and then the, the monitoring progress is the one that's going to hold it. But the, the point is, you can look at this code, and it makes sense. You're awaiting something, you're monitoring something, you're reporting progress, you're done. It, it's, it looks a lot like normal code that you would just write that's not even asynchronous at all. And that's where kind of the power of coroutines comes in. So channels were key to making that work because we need to communicate between two separate processes. One thing about channels is they are a low-level primitive. Um, they're helpful, but you want to prefer to use channels indirectly. So how do you use channels indirectly? Well, that's where flows come in. So flows are relatively new. Um, and the Cliff Note version of flows, if I was to kind of just go through that quickly, flows are cold. They're easy to write. And this is where your RxJava knowledge begins to map. And so a lot of us in the community, RxJava is an amazing like, thing. It's, it's an amazing tool. It was, it was revolutionary. And it, it really moved things forward. And so it, like, I used to be a Flex developer. And back in those days, I, I did a bunch of Flex. And I, I thought I knew everything about Flex. And then Flex died. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do next? And so it, it really stinks when you take that knowledge and you can't transfer it. Well, with RxJava, you can transfer that knowledge. And you can do all of the things that you're used to doing in RxJava with flows. And they're still under development. But the, the key thing about flows is they have the hindsight of RxJava to stand on. And they can say, oh, these were some of the things that were difficult. Like you have to use the visitor pattern. You have to wrap everything in objects. And maybe we can make that easier. Back pressure is really complicated. Well, suspending functions help with that because you, you're not blocking threads. You're just suspending. And so now back pressure becomes easy. Writing these flows becomes easy. And it was amazing to watch because flows were released. And then boom, 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 boom. All of these operators just started to show up. And it's every operator you need. And people are writing them. And then w one day, I like, needed to write a merge. And so I pull up the Rx. Java version, I'm like, OK, merge, and then back pressure. And it's, it's like all this code. And, and in coroutines, it's like three lines. You have a channel. You, you, launch, in, you, you launch one coroutine, you launch the other, and then you, you communicate through that channel. And so these flows are wrapping these primitives. They're wrapping these channels. They're wrapping these ways of doing things in a repeatable way. And that's what it means to be cold. So if you have a hot stream, that's a resource. Hot streams are great for helping you communicate, but they are something that you have to m be mindful of. You have to clean them up. You have to you know, make sure that you're not like, getting in deadlock, because like, you can get deadlock in channels. There's a thing called communication deadlock. So you can kind of think of it like a phone call. So like, if I am going to make a phone call to my wife, and my wife's calling me, it, like, in the old days, it's, it's just it's deadlock. I'm trying to reach her. And she can't answer because she's calling me, and I can't answer because I'm calling her. That happens with channels. And these kinds of things are nightmares and headaches. And these are the kinds of things that you know, ruin our lives and our evenings and our nights and, and make our hairs turn gray. And so flows are, I, I don't want to say beautiful because it's very opinionated, but <laughs> flows are just what we needed. Because before we had channels, and they were really kind of OK, and if flows now are something that can map to what we already know, the knowledge that we already have. And if you want to jump from Rx into um, coroutines, you can just you can do that very easily. And if, in, in the reverse, you can go from coroutines to Rx. There's an as flow operator. All of these things are very well documented. Once you understand all of these key concepts, you, you can very easily begin to migrate over. Um, there's a few other things with flows that I, I won't really dive into because it's a really long topic. Maybe it could be uh, another talk someday. But there's context preservation. There's exception transparency. Uh, what this really boils down to, exception transparency, really is really easy to understand. It basically means don't catch downstream exceptions. So anyone that's used flows, 
like I said, I'm not going to dive too much into flows, but when you emit something, you don't put a try catch block around that. So there's like some flow specific key concepts that will help you use those more efficiently. But overall, I think the official view is that this isn't like coroutine, good, Rx Java bad, stop doing this. It's not that other things are bad, it's just that coroutines are not a fad. The official view on coroutines is that they are a recommendation. In fact, at um, Google I.O., for Android Jetpack, they are coroutines first. So there was a presentation where um, they, it was like Yeet and Sean and Sergey, and it's, a, it's about coroutines. And at the end of that talk, I really suggest that you watch it, but they're in front of hundreds and hundreds of developers just a few months ago, and they're standing on stage saying, we really love coroutines. In fact, they took it a bit, a bit further and said, we believe coroutines provide the best functionality and ease of use for concurrency on Android. And this is from Google. That's not something to take lightly. They haven't made those kinds of statements with other technologies in the same way. So what does this all mean? Um, I think with coroutines, it's a lot like Kotlin. We've been in that place where we are working with a code base that's mostly Java. We want to get it into Kotlin. And so you, you just follow the routine. You know, if you're doing net new project, try coroutines. If you are fixing a bug, then maybe, you know, just like we did with Kotlin, wrap that in a test and then swap it out and put some coroutines in there and then make sure your tests still pass. And just begin to give coroutines a try. Um, I think that's it. So I wasn't planning to take questions, but I'm actually about 10 minutes early, and um, I have some time for questions. If there's anyone who wants to ask anything, I can try and help. Anything coroutine related? Yes. Do I? <laughs> so the question, I didn't hear the last part of that question. So the question is, an earlier speaker said, don't necessarily trust Google when they release things. Do you trust them on coroutines? Which is an excellent question. Um, Google is known to fail quickly. You know, they get rid of reader. They do these things. They try them out. Sorry, I hit my mic. Um, do I trust them on coroutines? Yes, for a lot of reasons. One, because they stood in front of a room full of, of engineers and said, we love this. They even had a little heart on the Android guy. Um, or Android bug. So I think that I kind of said, I kind of alluded to this in the beginning uh, about like the amount of respect that I have for Roman and the whole process around the community of Kotlin. Well, coroutines are first class citizen of Kotlin, and Kotlin is a serious commitment of Google. And so anytime you're using Kotlin, you can pretty much, for the you know, near future, you, you, you never know later, Kotlin things go away, but for the near future, you can pretty much be sure that Kotlin or uh, that coroutines are going to have full support on, on some level. Um, that's a good question. Any other questions? So I'm just going to say one more thing since I have some time. One of the slides that I took out, um, and it, it speaks to that question about Google. So they've created a library for testing coroutines, and it's, it's something like Kotlin X, Android, or coroutine test, something like that. Um, and this library is very useful. And you can do things like um, have a main dispatcher, because you don't get that for free. You have to, every implementation of Kotlin has to define that. And so you can get over that hurdle. You can create test scopes. You can do run blocking test. And then within that scope, while you're doing your test, you can f pause time. And so testing coroutines is tricky, because it's all timing based. Well, in this testing library, you can control time. So what that means is you can make tests that are instantaneous. And you can really exercise the edges of your code. So if you're using coroutines 
If you're, uh, if you're writing tests for them, I would strongly recommend checking out that library. It, also, with um, architecture components, they're making a, a big commitment. So in architecture components, in ViewModel itself, ViewModel has a scope. If you're a lifecycle owner, you have a scope. They've put this into the actual platform um, uh, libraries so that you can use coroutines directly. One little thing worth mentioning there with uh, scopes, with a with lifecycle scope, that can cancel at unexpected times. So if you're, if you're using architecture components, then you typically are going to want to use a view model scope to launch coroutines and to take care of cleanup and, and those kinds of things. So yes, I think there's a really big commitment from Google in a way that we haven't seen for other approaches to concurrency. Um, and I, overall, I'm just uh, I, very excited about coroutines. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time.